This podcast is made possible in part by Patreon support, and I'd like to say thank you to a few people who have joined recently. Uh, Sid Sada, uh, Teresa. Uh, Teresa, I got your uh, message on Patreon. It was a wonderful message. Thank you so, so much. Just such a nice, uh, just really reassuring message. Thank you so much. I'm glad you enjoy the show. Um, moving on. Uh, also, Jonathan Root, who is actually the guest for the, well, newest japan station episode um so it's crazy um even before he was a guest he decided to join the patreon thank you so so much um and and one more uh pekka who was already a patron but decided to up his pledge by quite a bit pekka you're amazing um thank you so so much you have absolutely no need to do that none of you have any need to be a patron i am not being a good salesperson here but uh, nevertheless you are and for that well i am super super grateful i mean thank you so so much um i have been really really busy with work lately um so i i i want to keep doing the show and i intend to keep doing the show but I, I you know i'm trying to find ways to kind of make things more efficient so that i can uh still have it be a pleasant experience and not being something you know stressful so you know one thing i'm considering is maybe hiring an editor or something like that i don't know but uh with a little bit of money you know now it's possible to at least consider doing those things so um thank you so so much everyone from the bottom of my heart thank you Sitsada, teresa uh jonathan rude and pekka thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you um if you want to join the patreon and and help me on this crazy thing that i'm doing then you can go over to japanke.com slash patreon join for as little as one dollar a month every dollar does help so Again, thank you guys. Uh, but anyway, let's get to the show. Welcome to Japan Station, a production of JapanKyo.com. I'm your host, Tony Vega. So I've got a lengthy episode jam-packed with tons of content for you, so I won't uh, dilly-dally here at the beginning. We're just going to get right into it. My guest today is Dr. Jonathan Root. He is a senior lecturer in film studies at the University of Greenwich and the author of the recent book, The Paths of Zatoichi, The Global Influence of the blind swordsman so as you may have guessed <laughs> dr root is a bit of an expert on japanese film uh, including of course zatoichi the very popular blind swordsman character from japanese film and tv um been around for decades and has influenced tons of uh well films and tv shows both uh in japan but also outside of japan and we're going to talk about all that stuff we're also going to talk about kitano takeshi the former comedian although he's he's still a bit of a funny guy but uh comedian turned international uh film director uh we're going to talk about some of his films a little bit of battle royale um and, and a few other things translations and subtitles and dubs and uh history of samurai films uh, just a little bit of everything but especially focusing on Kitano Takeshi and Zatoichi. Um, this conversation went on a little bit longer than I was thinking it would, but no complaints on my part. I had a blast talking to Dr. Root. So um, I'm gonna uh, leave out the usual outro just to save on time so I don't, you know, go super, super long. Uh, but of course, don't forget to uh, subscribe to the podcast and leave a rating and review, do all that stuff. I would greatly, greatly appreciate that. And by the way, uh, the movie Top Not Detective comes up in the conversation. Um, if you're curious about that, go check out episode one of Japan Station. That one uh, is about Top Knot Detective. I talked to the directors of that wonderful, amazing movie. Um, and if you want to check out the movie, well, go go do that. Go support them. I, I absolutely love that movie. I think it's such a well-made movie. But anyway, <laughs> today's episode isn't about Top Knot Detective. It's about Zatoichi, Kitano Takeshi, and, well, Dr. Jonathan Root. The next stop is Japan Station. The doors on the right side will open. What what got you into Japanese movies specifically? Was it like a specific movie, a director, or something like what? What was your uh, what was your gateway? 
That's a, a, a really good question. Um, someone asked me about this a few weeks ago. Um, I'll see if I come up with the same answer or if I remember <laughs> something different. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's always a really good question to answer because I meet so many people that are interested in Japanese films and media. Uh-huh. Um, and it's always a really interesting question to ask what, what got you um, started. Although I, I must say I've met a lot of people who have probably started on a similar route to me. I can't remember exactly what the first film it was that I saw. Uh-huh. But it's usually one of what's kind of known in the UK as this kind of holy trinity of films that mm-hmm. started the Tartan Asia Extreme label. I don't know if you've heard of that. Yes, uh, I have. I have seen it written on DVDs or whatever, stuff like that. Yeah. 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 I've still got a few of them on my shelf. And then every now and again, they get re-released and, and put on Blu-ray now. There's still a market in the UK for them. Have you mm-hmm. heard of the video? Uh, sorry, the DVD label Arrow? Arrow sounds familiar, but less yeah. so. Yeah, they've re- they've re-released a lot of them. They've got the Blu-ray rights to like Ring, Audition, mm. uh, okay. Old Boy. So lots of the Asia Extreme classics. Mm-hmm. Um, so I I came in through through those films. I didn't go to the cinema um, as part of that boom. I was a bit too young at the time, if I'm honest. Starting to reveal my age a bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but shortly afterwards um, that that started, the holy trinity of these films in the UK that got the label started were Battle Royale, Ring and Audition. Mm. Uh, okay, really yeah, Japanese I mean, I was, yeah. those kind of got me into it too, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I first, I think I first saw those on television. So this was a few oh, years really? after the cinema release. Yeah, I, um, I had uh, a VHS recorder and um i take these movies off of tv mm, uh, wow. because in the uk in the early 2000s a lot of them were being shown on channel 4 a uh, uk mm-hmm. channel uh-huh. and these were then being hosted by uh, the these film screenings were being hosted by the critic mark kermode who you mm-hmm. may have heard of i know he's got a bit of an international audience as well as mm. here in the uk um so he was he was hosting uh, these film screenings and basically saying, you know, why this uh, why this film is so important or why it's been such commercial success in Japan or overseas. Mm-hmm. And I can't remember for the life of me if it was Ring or Battle Royale that was first, but I think it was one of those mm-hmm. in the early mm-hmm. 2000s. And also at that same time, um, I remember, again, I can't remember if th- this was first or the live action films were first. I think around that time, I'd also seen Akira for the first mm. time, the famous anime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, oh. so that got me into it. And um, then um, not long after that, this is 2004, I go off to university and um, because I want to study film. Um, I think I was a bit hesitant about just going to study film studies at university and mm. maybe thinking my, uh, my parents were thinking, what the hell are you doing? Um, and partnered it with a more respectable subject. So I did film studies joint with history, mm-hmm. um, which I actually quite enjoyed. Um, mm. And you know, uh, that's kind of a culmination of the Zatoichi book. It's kind of a historical survey of this pop culture character. And it's also really grounded in, in film studies, of course. Mm, OK, um, so we we are basically like the exact same generation. Like, <laughs> really? Really? Yeah. Oh, that's that's comforting to hear. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Like same gateways, you know, Kitaro Takeshi and Takashi Miike were like the yes. two big things at the time that that started like making me explore like the larger you know japanese live action film like industry at, at the time like it started kind of with anime and then you know kitana takeshi and, and mika were particularly active around that time and yeah. you know it just pff, kind of blossomed from there yeah exactly i ended up doing my undergraduate dissertation on takeshi kitano Mm-hmm. or t- Kitano Takeshi sorry if you prefer mm-hmm. to say it that way um, <laughs> either way yeah all the, all the all, well all the all the publications I've come across all the way that he's marketed in the UK it's always uh, Takeshi Kitano uh, um, okay, over okay. here although I do have the confusing but great book by Cassio Abe which is uh Takeshi Kitano versus Deca- uh, Kitano Takeshi which doesn't clear it up at all um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, so that was a, uh, that ended up being my undergraduate dissertation. You know, looking at the mainly the critical reception of uh, Takeshi Kitano films, 
Um, and funnily enough, the idea for the Zatoichi book, I, I don't know if you saw this uh, mm-hmm. as or, or read this as part of the PDF that you saw, mm-hmm. um, but I I keep forgetting, I mentioned the acknowledgements. You know, I first had mm. this idea back in 2005 because I was an undergraduate and it was a second year project that I did mm-hmm. where I was just mm-hmm. getting to grips with um, or just coming across uh, Takeshi Kitano's filmography, mainly through Zatoichi first. Mm, I, I right, did a right. whole second year project on him. Yeah. Um, and uh, and after that, I think I, th- I was then lucky to discover that the University of Winchester had a copy of Violent Cop on the shelves, the DVD. Mm. Um, so it, it quickly, um, it quickly, you know, um, snowballed after that. Um, mm. In terms of me getting obsessed with Takeshi Kitano, deciding to do my dissertation on him. The slightly annoying thing about that was in the UK at the University of Winchester, there was no Asian cinema specialist uh, mm-hmm. teaching there. Um, the closest that I could be allocated in terms of a supervisor, and I'm really uh, glad that he was allocated, was a tutor that I had um, mm-hmm. who mm-hmm. was teaching about censorship in UK, uh, mm-hmm. the film censorship in the UK. And he was familiar with some Asian films because of that. Mm-hmm. Um, but mainly all his lessons were about horror films. And it was great because officially this this module was all about um, film policy and how films are censored. But it mm-hmm. also meant watching a gruesome film every week, which is fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, uh, but he was allocated as my supervisor. But I, I had to self-teach my uh, my uh, uh that's, sorry, that's the wrong way of say, say, saying it. I have basically had to become self-taught in Asian cinema. Mm, okay, um, okay. But I was I was buying in all the... Well, loads of my university uh, mates were um, uh, bemused by the amount of books I was buying. I was like, can't you get these through the library? And I was like, some of them were really tough to get hold of. So I ended mm-hmm. up buying my own little library of, of Asian cinema studies, at least what had been written in the English language mm-hmm. uh, by that time. Um, and that... Um, that ended up uh, fueling my undergraduate dissertation. A lot of that also went into my MA studies afterwards, my PhD studies, and I've kept hold of a lot of those books until today. Mm. Um, and I was glad that they were ended up being of use in the Zatoichi book. Mm. Um, so I've given you more detail on the beginning there because I think <laughs> that helps your question. But um, yeah, yeah, obviously, yeah, yeah. You, obviously you can tell that I've, I've stuck with this stuff since. Yeah, definitely. I mean, like for me, I, I think... Um, like the early 2000s-ish, like, yeah, right around that time, 2003, 2004, a few years later, like, there, I guess it kind of coincided with the big boom in blue. Uh, well, first it was DVD and then, you know, went into Blu-ray. But um, yeah. like, it was like every month there were more DVDs of, you know, these live action films coming out of Japan. You know, I was like looking around for the latest Mika film um, mm. and then going off on tangents from there, you know, like looking for the crazy stuff. I, I love that kind of stuff. Um, and, and so for me, like that, that I don't know, chunk of maybe like three, four five years, like I was really, really into uh, live action Japanese film. I, I just don't have enough time to keep up with everything these days but um no. like i i don't know there the japanese film industry in in that kind of genre budget range i don't know what you would yeah. say but seemed particularly active too at that time yeah yes it did the mm-hmm. interesting thing was what i've read about some of that especially the horror films being made then mm-hmm. and becoming very popular like the ring films and mm-hmm. then of course you one made after that they, they were made on such a low budget that they ended up being kind of surprise successes in Japan mm-hmm. and then even bigger successes overseas. Mm-hmm. Um, it, kind of, it kind of tells you that uh, interesting things, um, all sorts of interesting things. I won't go into a whole lecture on that. I mean, that's my day mm-hmm. job. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, uh, 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 loads of interesting things about you know if they're being made on a low budget in Japan, it suggests that no one thinks this that stuff is going to work. Mm-hmm. Um, and yet, and yet, there's a long history of this. Um, I also know the scholar Tom Mez, who was um, good enough to um, endorse the book. Mm-hmm. Um, he originally from the Netherlands. Now he's in Japan. He's a he's another interesting guy. Um, you may be able to interview for your podcast. Oh, in fact, he, he knows, I'd, I'd say he knows a lot more than I do about mm-hmm. Japanese cinema. As I said, I, I self-taught uh, myself uh, a, a lot of this stuff mm-hmm. um, with my undergraduate studies. I've kind of, you know, find it difficult to keep up like you do. Mm-hmm. And I also have a wide range of tastes. I'm not just watching Asian cinema. I'm interested in what Hollywood's doing, mm-hmm. um, local British productions, all sorts. Yeah. Um, and I teach a lot of world cinema classes, so I try to broaden my horizons and try and um, make my students aware of what's happening around the world. 
um, mm -hmm. as well. But Tom Mez knows a lot more than I do. And he'd probably argue there's a longer history of this kind of like extreme focused content, whether it's horrors, whether it's violence, whether it's gangster films, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but a longer history through like V cinema, a straight to video cinema. I don't know if you've heard that term before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah from like the uh, 80s and 90s where this stuff was being made straight to video. And then before that, of course, you had your specialist kind of uh, showcase um, film distributors and ex exhibitors in cinemas, which were mainly mm -hmm. focused around the most famous examples are made around sex uh, mm -hmm. films or sure. softcore sex films like Pinku and uh, then uh, Roman porno, although that's, that was also straight to video mm -hmm. um, just after the 70s. Um, so yeah, there's a long history of this stuff, and then Asia Extreme could be seen as like or um, uh, another boom in that sort of cycle. You know, extreme focused gruesome content, which started off with Japan with some famous one films from, as I mentioned, Kinji Fukusaku, who mm. kind of relates back to the point that I'm making because he's got long history in gangster films, right? Yeah, um, uh, vi violent gangster films, both theatrical and then uh, I think he might have done some B cinema productions. Again, Tom Mez would, would know more than me for sure. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, arguably his most famous film is now Battle Royale, very, very different mm -hmm. kind of film, um, but also seen alongside, you know, the, the gruesome kind of horror classics of Audition and Ring. They're, they're often uh, put side by side in, um, in the UK, especially through Arrow Video, as I've mentioned. Of course, I've, I've stupidly forgot to mention um they've re-released audition ring um all three ring films and of course they they keep re-releasing and um uh you know um people like me keep buying it because we can't help ourselves <laughs> they keep re-releasing battle royale as well they, <laughs> that, that's now on 4k uhd thanks to oh, Arrow, nice. they 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 know that people in the uk and around the world will still buy that film yeah it's um, classic yeah yeah, yeah. Um, I think Arrow released the DVD of um, Top Knot Detective. Maybe that's why I know the name. Oh, maybe. did they release Top Knot in the USA? Did um, they? So I, I think it was like a, an international release. You could only get it online. I think it was something like that. Um, right. Okay. Oh, yeah. yes. That, that makes sense because they're partnered with Third Window. And here in the uh, UK, okay. that's, that's who I have the Blu-ray. Uh, uh, okay. It's a really interesting uh, Blu-ray because you get a commentary from the directors yeah. on, on the film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I mean, I, I know, I know you, you mentioned it in the Beyond Japan interview, but you, you like that movie. I absolutely love that movie as well. I think they did an yeah. amazing job. Check out episode one, guys. I interview the directors of, of Top Knot Detective. It's a very fun conversation. Yes, and I, I can recommend that. Thank you for pointing that out to me because oh. that was that was fascinating listening to. <laughs> no, they're just such fun guys. They it was like they, such they a are. passion project, and and they yeah. pulled it off masterfully. I thought so. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I just couldn't believe as well, you know, it's it's so glad to see as well that they were inspired by mockumentary things like Garth Marenghi's Dark Place. It has yeah. such that vibe uh, yeah, about yeah. it. It's it's a great, uh, it's not just great for people of lovers of uh, Asian popular culture. It's it's great in terms of if you're a fan of the mockumentary genre, this is a great yeah. example, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I love both. So it's <laughs> like, <just> yeah, <laughs> wonderful for me. So, yeah. Um, Okay, so uh, all right, so Kitano Takeshi was a particularly important kind of influence and, and, and thing that you latched on to early on. Um, but yeah. I, I guess it was the Zatoichi film was no Battle Royale, and then and then you got into Zatoichi, and then I guess you started exploring everything else. Yeah, um, by coincidence, as I said, the University of Winchester had violent, a violent cop DVD on mm -hmm. the shelf. It was really yeah. coincidental, and uh, and then I was quickly tracking down his other films since. I think I was lucky in that. At that time, I was able to buy a lot of them on DVD. Some mm -hmm. of them I had to wait till later. And then I supported Third Window Films again when they released a lot of them on Blu-ray, mm -hmm. um, which is handy. Mm -hmm. um, um, but yeah, I, I found in the early 2000s, you know, he, that was kind of his peak popularity. It's a few years yeah. after his uh, win of um, uh, with the Golden Lion, the Hanabi or Fireworks. Yeah. Um, really annoyed me that popped up on movie the other day. I'm like, I've always known this film as Hannah B and you're calling it fireworks. But anyway, oh, really? <laughs> yeah, uh, it's the same. Uh, it's, it's the same film. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, he was, he was and... even, even in that, like, I think it was an American film brother. 
right? With like Omar yeah. Epps. Um, yeah, he directed that as well. Oh, he okay. Yeah. He directed that one. All right. Yeah, I I, I, I actually own the DVD yeah. for that. I I will say yeah. I I don't particularly I don't particularly remember enjoying it all that much. I don't think it was that eh, not his best no, work it, perhaps, but <laughs> it's, it's not his best. I don't yeah. I don't think it's his worst film. Although yeah. I have to say I haven't been able to watch his most recent films, which I've heard not great things about. I did. Yeah, see I haven't three, seen those either. Yeah. I did see all three outrage films and they kind mm-hmm. of blurred into the same film, if I'm honest. Uh-huh. <laughs> they're hard to tell apart. Um, they're, but they're I really mean, are. that just goes to show how crazy pop, well, that was kind of like peak popularity, right? Like he actually had a movie come out with American yeah. actors in the US, you know, yeah. with, with Omar Epps, who at the time was pretty well known, right? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, uh, definitely his peak popularity. I don't, I don't think his popularity peaked as much since the Zatoichi remake because mm-hmm. that was his biggest hit in Japan as mm-hmm. well as around the world. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's the interesting place that uh, that features in his filmography because, of mm-hmm. course, you you probably know that his films haven't tended to be very popular um, yeah. in Japan because he's still primarily known till this day as being like the TV comedian and presenter. That's yeah, yeah, and I mean, he's for. still on TV very regularly. Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. I mean, this guy's old. Like, he's, he's not yet, but he's yeah. still talking it up. People love him still on TV. Exactly, and I think he's still painting and yeah, 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 doing yeah. Lord knows what else as well. The guy uh-huh. just can't seem to slow down. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it makes me wonder. I think it's been a little while. Oh no, wait, I heard this announcement. Um, he didn't. T- I know someone that went there to mm-hmm. the Udine Far East Festival mm-hmm. in Italy. And apparently he was going to turn up and uh, uh, um, receive a Lifetime Achievement Award. Sadly, oh. he didn't in the end. Oh, but he okay. called in via video link and said okay. he's working on a new film. So oh, jeez, man. <laughs> yeah. So he's, he's still not slowing down. I've yeah, just got yeah. to catch up on his last couple of films. I've still not seen um, Glory to the Filmmaker, oh. The Tortoise, and... Uh, oh, it's Achilles and the Tortoise, isn't it? Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm totally out of the loop. I, I, I wasn't sure yeah. what, what it was. Yeah, and and also, I'm kind of curious to see it, but I've only read bad reviews for it. I'm still curious. <laughs> he also did a yakuza comedy called oh. Ry- Ryuzo and the Seven Henchmen. I think. Now that sounds interesting. Yeah, that sounds yeah. interesting to me too. I'm yeah. gonna have to make some time to well see if I can source a copy. Yeah. Um, yeah. If not, as I know a lot of my fellow scholars do as well, sometimes mm-hmm. you're left to just finding these films digitally yeah, online yeah, yeah. if you can. Um, uh, but I'll have to make some time to do that. I mean, you know, I still uh, r- rather than than do that, I've had scholars. Um, you know, uh, I I know people at other universities that have researched a lot piracy mm-hmm. and how it can mm-hmm. be a benefit sometimes for people and consumers. Um, as well as being a hindrance perhaps to the industry yeah, um, yeah. just because I can now I try to support all the DVD and Blu-ray labels that I can but um, none of them have released Kitano's most recent films hmm, um, but I still keep I still keep up to date on what uh, labels like Third Window do who mm-hmm. released uh, Top Knot Detective and loads of other great films yeah, um, yeah, but yeah. I am kind of biased in that way because they were one of the labels that um, did feature in my PhD thesis so mm, that's a, another reason um, and, they, and they've they've really broadened my horizons in terms of Japanese cinema. They're releasing stuff that is very different to the infamous uh, Tartan Asia extreme trend, which has characterized Asian cinema or certain views of Asian cinema in the UK and other mm-hmm. countries for so long now. Third Window have always, uh, Adam Terrell in particular, who's the main guy behind Third Window, has really made it his aim to uh, show that Japanese cinema is more than just Asia extreme. There's a lot more. Right. There. Definitely. Really yeah. interesting. Um, all right. So, uh, just one more question about, um, Kitano Takeshi, but like, if, if you were to, if somebody were to say like, I'm, I'm curious what, what would be a good film to start out with? If I want to check out some of his films, what do, what do you think? Would you have, uh, any, uh, favorites or any, uh, suggestions? Oh, that's a <laughs> heck of a question. I mean, <laughs> most people just say Hannah B cause it, it might well be his, his best film. Mm-hmm. Um, I've still got a soft spot for, I've mentioned it a few times already, but I have rewatched it a heck of a lot and I still really like it is violent cop mm-hmm. or um, um, I'm always, uh, uh, I've always been intrigued by the actual title it has in Japan and the way it was marketed as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, I'm probably going to butcher this because my, my Japanese is probably nothing like yours. Cause I've heard some of your other podcasts where you're like, Oh, I, I do this in my spare time. Like, you know, like translate and, and learn <laughs> Japanese. <laughs> well, thank you. I, I, 
I, I haven't had the time since getting into higher education. I find yeah. it uh, all my energy is been into trying to get students interested in this stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, I've I've only learned a tiny bit of Japanese on the wayside, and I'm trying to remember from my undergraduate days. I did learn the the Japanese title. I think it's Sono Otoko Kyobo Nitsuki. Okay. Which I probably butchered, and I've been told that that translates as "Watch out, this guy is dangerous." Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that could, be, kyobo, kyobo. could be, could be. Well, I, I'll have to, I'll, I'll double check on that. But that one is violent cop. Yeah. So I did indeed check, and yes, Doctor Root was absolutely correct. Sono toko kyobo nitsuki is the Japanese title of violent cop, and. Yes, I think that's a perfectly fine translation. Uh, watch out, this guy's violent, or watch out, this guy's dangerous. I think that's fine. Uh, kyobo can mean violent or ferocious, or in some translations, I guess you could go with dangerous. So again, the Japanese title is Sono Toko Kyobo Nitsuki. Uh, that was how the, the poster for... Um, uh, that was how this film was marketed through the poster. It was just that uh, Japanese writing yeah. on a poster of Kitano just standing there. Yeah. saying, watch out, this guy is dangerous. Apparently, yeah. the story is most people, because it's Kitano, and this is 1989, so he's yeah. a big TV celebrity then. <laughs> yeah, he's still the comedian, people, yeah. Yeah, apparently most people are going to the cinema expecting a comedy. Yeah. Um, have you seen Violent Cop? Uh, I have not. It's on my eternal list of like, I need to watch that, yeah. but I never got around to it. Yeah, well, when you watch it, you realize yeah. very quickly it's not a comedy. So it was, <laughs> may have horrified audiences at the time i mean um it was it was given the title violent cop in the usa and the uk mainly because i think they were trying to uh market it as dirty harry it's not quite dirty harry but it's closer to dirty harry than a comedy that's for sure mm -hmm. um it's very much that that sort of film and I, I i still really like it i've heard a lot of people go back and say some of his um perhaps least loved films deserve a bit more appreciation and he's it's true he's made a lot of good films um like i've i've read a lot about how people really appreciate his second film boiling point oh, yeah, um, yeah. which which i still don't i uh, enjoy as much still got mm -hmm. a soft spot for violent cop so i'd say hanabi violent cop and i'm just looking over at my shelf where i've got a few of these titles i i must say i wasn't expecting this the second or third time i watched it i realized i really enjoyed kids return as well the first mm. film he made after his accident okay um yeah, that that's a good one too. It's got mm. a really good soundtrack into it. I I look over at the Blu-ray box and uh, I keep remembering the soundtrack by Joe Hisaishi, and I'm like, yes. Yeah, oh, really good. Joe, he did that one. Okay, now I'm I'm very interested now. <laughs> oh right, yeah. If you haven't seen a lot of Kitano's yeah. early films, he uh -huh. used to collaborate with Joe Hisaishi a lot. Oh, um, I didn't know that. And and the turning point was the Zatoichi film, oh. where unfortunately I've forgotten the composer's name. Um, but he switched to a different composer and he also got the group, um, the Stripes involved to do the big tap dance finale that's mm. in the film. Yeah, I remember that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm Zatoichi, like I, 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 have, I have to admit I haven't seen it, but I think I had a DVD of it or something. And I, mm -hmm. I happened to come across like the ending and go, well, whoa, this seems interesting because <laughs> it's the big tap yeah. dance thing at the end. So I've seen that, but I, I haven't yeah. seen the whole film. Oh, it's it's fantastic! I love that piece of music as well. It's the it's my ringtone at the moment. Oh, so, uh, <laughs> my phone goes off when I have it on loud, and I want to tap dance. Of course, I don't <laughs> because I have two left feet, and I'm not as talented as they are. But it always puts yeah. a smile on my face. <laughs> um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about Zatoichi then. So, um, so it was the Kitano Takeshi film that was your gateway into Zatoichi, and and you know what 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 kind of piqued your interest about Zatoichi in general. Yeah, it was that film that came out. I saw all the press for it. There was some really interesting press and marketing going around. This doesn't happen so much in the UK now, unless it's someone like um, Hirokazu Koreeda or more recently the films of Ryosuke Hamaguchi. Those sort of films are really marketed mm. and promoted a lot in the cinema. Um, and then more on, for home media releases um, afterwards, if they're really popular or if they do well in terms of awards. But at that time, you know, films like Zatoichi were coming out. And Zatoichi, if I remember rightly, were, was the same uh, release year as also like Old Boy and mm. other big Asian hits coming um, from both Japan, South Korea mm -hmm. and other parts of East Asia. Um, so these films were tending to get a cinema release mm -hmm. um, and not just going to, you know, um, straight to DVD and Blu-ray now, which is what Third Window focuses on. Mm -hmm. 
um, or, or straight onto a streaming service because more and more of these films are being bought up and sometimes incorrectly marketed as, as Netflix originals or Amazon originals. Right. Whereas actually, you know, Netflix or Amazon actually come in later and decide yeah. to buy the film so they can put it on a tr- streaming platform. Right. Um, so at, at that time in 2003, lots of these films are, are going at the cinema and being marketed a lot. And I remember seeing the poster for Zatoichi because it was also the same year that Kill Bill came out or um, oh, in the uh-huh. UK. Uh-huh. Actually, I think there was a there was a bit of a release delay there. Now, now we're used to like global same day right. releases. Um, at that time, there was a little bit of delay. So I think it was actually in 2004. So just after Kill Bill comes out, Zatoichi comes out. And there's a quote from another famous British film critic, Jonathan Ross, who says, Kill Bill, Zatoichi would wipe the floor with him. So they had that quote on the poster, uh, uh-huh. which always made me laugh and got me uh, intrigued in the film, as well as the um, image of Zatoichi, um, uh, of Kitano himself as Zatoichi, yeah. on the cover of the, uh, the poster that would also be on the DVD release. <laughs> um, so I was fascinated with that and I also remember in the University of Winchester Library thankfully they had a subscription going for the Sight and Sound magazine run by the British Film Institute here in the UK mm. and there was this massive feature piece um, done about the Zatoichi film which touched a bit on Kitano's film career which got me interested in that and also mm. there was a very brief segment written about the history of the Zatoichi character mm. and that's where I first learned this isn't the first Zatoichi film. There's a long history of this character and that got me immediately yeah. hooked. So as part of my undergraduate research, um, I had an open brief for one of the classes that I was doing and I, I decided to base some research around the Zatoichi films. I tried to do a comparative study of the 2003 Zatoichi film and the first one, because I could get hold of that on DVD, I had, despite me buying, all, well, probably because of me buying all these Asian cinema books, I couldn't buy up all these films on DVD. I mean, by the time <laughs> gotcha. Kitano's film comes out, there's 27 films. Yeah, and yeah. I think at that time, they hadn't all been released in the UK on DVD anyway. So I definitely couldn't afford expensive DVD imports. Yeah. Um, but I managed to get hold of the first one and compare that with the second one because I'd found a structure a structural analysis of samurai films written by the great scholar David Dessa in in one of the textbooks I managed to get hold of, uh-huh. where he kind of, he tries to analyze the structure of the samurai film in a similar way to uh, old folk tales, um, mm-hmm. which is a method of analyzing stories pioneered by Vladimir Prop, a Russian scholar who was, who was trying to document all the cases of fairy tales that he could come across and trying to argue if they all followed largely similar structures um, where a hero is established and then the villain, the hero has to go on a quest or save a princess, et cetera, et cetera. Here in the end, usually hero kills the villain. Hmm. Um, David Dessa came up with a similar structure for the samurai films or, or Shambara in particular, sword action films or um, the literal translation of Shambara is, is the onomatopoeic sound of swords clanging. So that's mm. why they're called Shambara in, in Japanese, which is a, um, a, in case any of your listeners aren't aware, that's, that's kind of a, a niche genre or smaller category within the much broader category, of course, of Jidai Geki, which broadly means period film. Mm. Um, and I explain this to my students saying, Yes, there's lots of films about samurai, but they're not all shambara. A jidai yeah. geki is a very broad category. You know, you can have comedies, romance, it, 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 anything that mm-hmm. is a jidai geki, a period drama film. Um, but shambara is very specific to, often tied to what, how, what Kurosawa pioneered with his famous films, although there are earlier examples of, of, of shambara, uh, mm-hmm. even from the silent era. Um, so... I found this analysis of, of um, samurai films and thought I'd compare and contrast the um, the Kitano film and the first Shintaro Katsu film from mm. 1962, the very first film where Zatoichi uh, appears on screen. And I found that there were a lot of um, similarities in terms of story structure. They mm. both so followed the same narrative structure, but that analysis of the story in that way kind of, didn't take into account how different these films are in terms of how Kitano is getting Zatoichi to look. Um, very different music that is used. You could argue there's much different tone. There was always comedy in Shintaro Katsu's uh, earlier films, mm-hmm. but 
comedy is uh, especially rhythmic musical comedy is much more of a thing in the Kitano film mm-hmm. um, especially through the different composer that he gets in after working with Joe Hisaishi for years and and the um, the the dance choreography of the stripes mm-hmm. um, as well um, so yeah that was my analysis ultimately ended up being so I my knowledge of Zatoichi grew out of that I think I was then able to get hold of not long after that um the one of the only others after which he films which has been released multiple times in the uk was uh shintaro katsu's last film that oh. he made in 1989 so i had a big gap in my viewing knowledge for a good number of years um you know i'd seen the first after which film i'd seen the uh shintaro katsu's last after which film i'd seen the takeshi kitano film and um, then shortly after that while i was doing my ma um also released in the uk was the 2008 film Ichi, where uh, it's mm. a female uh, blind swordsman who's mm. the protagonist. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and that did become part of my MA thesis, though it wasn't the entire focus of it. Um, and when was my MA thesis? Oh, this is racking my brain now. <laughs> uh, my, my master's in film studies. I was doing that part-time from about 2008 to 2010. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't until 2014 that finally I managed to get a lot of the Zatoichi films on DVD. Oh, okay. So, yeah, there was a big gap in between my knowledge of Zatoichi, but uh, mainly ever since um, that article that I mentioned that I read, which Mm -hmm. I'm kind of annoyed I didn't reference in the book now. I should have gone back through the archives and found that article. (laughs) <laughs> but there was so uh, there was so much other stuff I found written on sure, Zatoichi sure. over the years. Um, uh, but that that BFI article from when uh, from 2003 2004 when the Kitano film came out that that kind of put this idea in the head, which slowly grew in the back of my mind. I'm like, I, I kept coming across uh, lots and lots of literature written about Japanese samurai films or Shambhala films. Um, and not a lot was being written by Zatoichi. Sometimes they devote a small chapter to him or part of a chapter or even just mm-hmm. a few paragraphs saying, oh, yeah, and in the 60s and 70s, Shintaro Katsu played a popular character called the Blind Swordsman, where each film was basically the same. And mm-hmm. I, I just couldn't help thinking, really? Is that the case? Are they, are they that similar that you need to be dismissed by this? And um, I kept thinking, I'm keeping this idea in the back of my head for way too long. Someone else is going to write on this. Yeah. Um, but it never happened. So I decided to write it. And by the time the book came out, well, it turned out to be a few months later after the book came out. The publisher was very keen to get it out in 2021. Mm-hmm. Um, but then I just thought, well, if, if a few months later, it'll be 2022. It's the mm-hmm. 60th anniversary of the Zatoichi films, oh, uh, the oh. first Zatoichi film. So what better way to market? So that's why I've been um you've probably heard me on those other podcasts yeah, promoting yeah, yeah. this as well as uh, i finally did my online book launch um yeah. just last month on the uh through the japan foundation and on their on the japan foundation london youtube page you can still find a recording um of that book launch oh, it's, it's, it's awesome it's awesome yeah yeah um, I mean, like, okay, so maybe if you ask like a 15 year old in Japan these days, maybe not so much, but of a certain generation, yeah. like Shintaro Katsu and Zatoichi in general is like, everybody knows who you're talking about. Like, this is yeah. like a culturally significant person and overall like property. Right. And, and yet, like, I think it it's gone on to influence a whole bunch of stuff that many of us in the West, like don't even realize. Um, yeah. even though like many people may not be familiar with Zatoichi, like, the, the property itself but there's things that have influenced things that we have consumed right exactly mm-hmm. hey, exactly um this is again i think i briefly mentioned it to you earlier the fact that i i this is how i tried to get my students interested in this stuff mm-hmm. is um through the fact that he is he is such a significant pop culture icon in fact i make this comparison a couple of times in the book and it's maybe unfair because it makes zatoichi sound like some sort of monster character although that's not <laughs> the point i'm trying to make uh-huh. i make some comparisons to the fact that you know you have globally recognized characters like king kong and godzilla who are massive pop culture figures mm-hmm. and godzilla especially is another popular one from japan that has a similar number of films there's mm-hmm. 29 i think official godzilla oh. japanese godzilla films 
Uh-huh. And there's 29 official Japanese Zatoichi films. Oh, wow. Um, which reminds me, in 20, 2014, uh, when I finally had so many of these films on DVD, I decided to set myself a crazy task, which I don't think a few people cared about uh, <laughs> uh, uh, that year, but I blogged about it anyway. I watched 30 <laughs> Zatoichi films in 30 days. <laughs> Um, uh-huh. And that blog is still online uh, uh-huh. to to prove to people that I did it, and it's still ter- <laughs> still terribly written. If you want to go have a look at it, um, and I still stick by a lot of my opinions in terms of it was more out of personal enjoyment. That were I, I and I hasten to add that is not what I put in the book. The book was very different in terms sure. of writing that. These were kind of more reviews of my own experiences. You know, my thoughts on the films. Um, and watching them in a very short space of time. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, any particularly good listeners of yours will realize, hang on, you said 30 days of Zatoichi, and you said there are only 29 Japanese Zatoichi films. That's because I decided to sneak in, because I couldn't help myself, the only Hollywood remake of a Zatoichi film, which is Blind Fury, the Rook oh. Hoya film, uh, <laughs> where he, say, he, he says he's playing a blind character, and the film says he's playing a blind character, but he's playing it with his eyes open, trying to look blind. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that aside, actually, it's a pretty decent cheesy action film from the 1980s. Uh, funnily yeah. enough, out in the same year, 1989, as Shintaro Katsu's last Satoichi film, as it happened. Uh. Both came out in the same year. That's the only official um, remake of a Satoichi film. It's in the credits and everything. It says this is based on Satoichi Challenged, which I also think is great because that's one of the best uh, Shintaro Katsu Satoichi films. It ends in this really iconic um, and snow swept duel between Zatoichi and a samurai, oh. um, which won't spoil the plot in terms of how that comes about. And it also ends in an unexpected way, too. Hmm. Um, I, I won't spoil that either, but it's interesting. That's in 1967. And then it's uh, not until 1974, something like Lady Snowblood comes out, which is also in this snow swept. Um, uh, uh, has some of these sword swept. Uh, sorry has some of these snow-swept um, sword fight scenes, mm-hmm. which were, again, uh, d- many decades later, you know, Quentin Tarantino Quentin is on Tarantino, Martin, yeah. in, Kill Bill. In, in Kill Bill. Yeah. yeah. But I, I wonder, hmm, was Zatoichi there first with this really cool snowy finale in, in Zatoichi Challenge? I, I wonder. Mm-hmm. Um, sorry, I forgot the original point. <laughs> the, what, well, the, kind of the way that Zatoichi. it's influenced the yeah. larger, yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, uh, it's, it's influenced yeah, so many things. I mean, yeah, that was a good illustration. Case sure, in yeah. point, you know, it has been influential, you could argue, on Kill Bill and other things that have homaged, you know, lots of Asian popular culture. But the specific figure of Zatoichi, you know, um, it's, it's not immediately clear how he has homaged some really big um, popular characters. I mean, uh, Godzilla is immediately iconic. Zatoichi, you could argue, maybe not as much. But as I said, mm. there's, a, interestingly enough, a similar number of Japanese films um, but there are homages to this character around the world. So where I usually start telling students how this character has an influence around the world is through um, the web series adaptation of Daredevil. Um, oh. You can't really see a- a- any evidence of a Zatoichi influence, I don't think, in the 2003 Ben Affleck film uh, of Daredevil, <laughs> if you've seen no, that one. Yeah, I, I, um, I've seen both, yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think it's more clear the influence from the uh, the series that was first on Netflix and now on Disney Plus, mm-hmm. and also, funnily enough, you can find both these titles now on Disney Plus. It sounds like I'm advertising for them. <laughs> but the other the, the, the other influence is on uh, you can see is in Star Wars Rogue One, uh-huh. um, which came out in 2016. So again, it's it's interesting. Those two examples come out in similar times. The Daredevil series was uh, broadcast initially on Netflix from 2015 to 2018. And Mm. uh, Rogue One's right in the middle there in 2016. So you've got Donnie Yen's character of Chirrut Imwe in Star Wars Rogue One. And when I started teaching full time at the University of Greenwich, um, I decided in my first year that I was working there I'd, I'd also rent somewhere nearby so I could be on hand and get to familiar with the university and the area nearby um, uh, which was great for one thing because I was just across the river from the Excel Centre in the UK which runs basically the equivalent of Comic-Con here in the UK Oh, okay. the MCM Comic-Con mm-hmm. and in May 2017 when I started at the University of Greenwich Donnie Yen was there at Comic-Con oh. and it was it was just a few months after Rogue One had come out 
-hmm. And I was there when he did an interview on stage where he confirmed that um, his character Turo Dimwe was influenced by Zatoichi because he said he'd watched a lot of those films growing up in Hong Kong. Mm. Which, which told me about how popular they were in Hong Kong as well as, of course, in Japan. And I, I know that they slowly became popular around the world because there's been so many first VHS releases of Zatoichi films and later DVDs. And of course, now uh, now they're on Blu-ray. Now they're part of the Criterion collection of all places. Mm. You you know you often associate the Criterion Blu-rays with like artistically, historically important yeah. films. I never expected Zatoichi to end up there. Now it <laughs> yeah. includes things like Lone Wolf and Cub and Bruce Lee films. I think it's great. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, so, so yeah, Chirrut's, um, Chir- Chirrut Inwe in Rogue One shows that. And then in Daredevil, you could say, yeah, there's a lot of similarities with Daredevil and the blind superhero himself, but specific similarities, if you've seen the Daredevil series, can be mm-hmm. seen with the character of Stick, his mentor. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, who you first see in the first season of Daredevil as a Japanese man. Uh, well, no, sorry, he's not a Japanese man. Apologies. He's played by Scott Glenn. He's definitely yeah. not Japanese, but he is speaking Japanese and he is wielding a samurai sword and he is killing Yakuza. This is very much what Zatoichi does. Yeah. Um, and, and you see him do that in that first episode with Stick. And um, yeah, it was a great source of inspiration for the web series uh, uh what they mostly stuck with i think for the most of that series when it was on was taking inspiration from frank miller's 1980s stories of daredevil right. where he introduces this character of stick so i think he uh, and he also introduces the the ninja group the hand mm-hmm. um so i think he's very much influenced by east asian popular culture and it suggests to me, you know, he might have been aware of this concept of the blind, uh, popular figure of the blind swordsman. And mm-hmm. so that probably it's made its way into the Daredevil comics, definitely in the 80s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, well, it's gotten to this point where it's like maybe the first person was influenced by Zatoichi, but now the second person is influenced by the thing that was influenced by Zatoichi. <laughs> and it just goes on and on and on, right? <laughs> exactly. And um, another, uh, another thing you just reminded me of is uh-huh. that she, there, there's a parallel influences here of both the character of Zatoichi and also the guy behind the scenes, Shintaro Katsu. Uh-huh. This also takes me back to Top Knot Detective. This is why I want, uh, got to mention it in the book. Sadly, there isn't a blind swordsman in Top Knot. True, yeah. <laughs> if they ever made a sequel, it would be great to see one. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, that would be fantastic. But they were more inspired by Shintaro Katsu's notorious lifestyle of being a difficult <laughs> actor to work with sometimes. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, there's one there's one famous story that apparently Shintaro Katsu was going to be in um, in Kagemusha, the okay. later Kurosawa film uh-huh. uh, from 1980, if I remember rightly. That's uh, yet again. I've just realized that. Sorry, this is how my brain works. Um, uh, there's another link to Star Wars there. Kagemusha oh. was actually financed by Western filmmakers because Kurosawa wasn't doing that well in terms of his film career in the late Uh 70s and early 80s. Um, So Kagemusha was partly financed by George Lucas and Francis Ford Coppola. (laughs) Because they were such admirers of his work. <laughs> Lucas and is paying, think... it, paying it back because he was influenced by, by Kurosawa for Star Wars, right? So Exactly. Yeah. Yes. I'm glad you're aware of that. Not, yeah. not many people are. Again, something I, I love telling my students about, you know, uh, yeah. gets you thinking how Japanese Star Wars is. And then I have another lesson which really does their brain in um, getting them to think about how British Star Wars is because most of the films are actually shot in Britain. Yeah. Um, and, well, there's a whole lot of British accents. <laughs> yes. Yes, there are. Most definitely. Yeah. And still still at the moment. I mean, yeah. you and McGregor's back as Obi-Wan. Exactly. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, another way that Shintaro Katsu were. Oh, sorry. Uh, I almost forgot the story. Uh, uh, apparently, a famous story about Shintaro Katsu was that he was originally going to be in Kagamusha. Oh, so yeah, yeah. He started filming some of his own scenes. Oh, um, wow. From the script and was kind of su- trying to supersede what Kurosawa was doing. As soon as Ooh. Kurosawa heard about this, he got fired. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So, yeah, you can understand why if, if that is the story. Again, mm. um, I've, I've not been able to confirm that much amongst hearsay, although I have seen it published in a few English language books. So I reckon there's some grain of truth to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but the other way that Shintaro Katsu was influential behind the scenes, he wasn't just this notorious kind of star difficult to work with he made a hell of a lot of stuff and again hugely influential in terms of western popular culture at least our perception of of japanese popular culture yes the zatoichi films have had a huge influence mm-hmm. but 
his uh, brother was also in another really popular film series, not so popular in Japan as it happens, as it was in the West, mm -hmm. in terms of the Lone Wolf and Cub films. Oh. So, mm -hmm. so the lead in Lone Wolf and Cub, that playing the character of uh, Ogami Ito, yeah. is Tomisaburo Wakayama, who is Shintaro Katsu's brother. Oh, wow. Okay. I, I never, and, never knew that. Okay. And Shintaro Katsu produced those films through his production company. Wow. Okay. So if it wasn't for him, we also wouldn't have Shogun Assassin, which was, of yeah. course, famously re-edited from mm -hmm. the first two films in Lone Wolf and Cub. And we wouldn't have had that blatant name drop again in Kill Bill, would we? Because it yeah. turns up there again, doesn't it? Shogun yeah. Assassin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, well, in, in general, um, Lone Wolf and Cub, I mean, has been so influential. Mandalorian, right? Look at Mandalorian, yeah, right? Like that's, exactly. that's Lone Wolf and Cub, basically. <laughs> it, it, it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. I know another researcher uh, who I'm pretty sure teaches, still teaches in Belfast. He's given loads of conference papers on the influence of the Lone Wolf and Cub uh, narrative and um, its influence around the world in film and TV. And Tom yeah. Mez, again, touches on this in one of the books that I, I referenced in the Zatoichi book. He, he wrote a great book, which you might be able to still get um, online, probably through secondhand copies now. He, he published a whole history of the Lone Wolf and Cub franchise uh, called Father, Son and Sword, um, um, which I highly recommend. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Um, okay, so, uh, I mean, I could ask you more and more and more and more about uh, Zataichi, <laughs> but you know, we, we've got a whole book for you guys. You can, you can learn more and more and more <laughs> about Zataichi. So, but um, I, I am curious, like, okay, so what do you have like a good entry point for someone? Cause you, you're saying there's 29 films. Yeah. Like, is it yeah. start with the Shintarakatsu, start with Kitara Takeshi, go back from there. Like wh which way do you think would be the better uh, way to start? Uh, again, a uh, really good question. Mm -hmm. Um, if if you want to, if if you want to read about these these films first of all mm -hmm. and think about a good entryway, you can you can do it that way. Not mm -hmm. necessarily through the book because um, it is it is an academic book. These tend right. to be expensive to purchase, mm -hmm. but uh, I'll maybe mention that later on. My publisher has been very generous and they've given a discount code oh. for the whole of this year awesome. um, because it's the 60th anniversary. So I'll mm -hmm. try and remember to mention that later. So yeah. if you're interested in the book, go that way. Oh, and if you want to buy the book digitally, that's the cheaper way to do it too okay. from their, their website, the um, Roman and Littlefield website. Mm -hmm. um, uh, also, you can still read, as I mentioned, it's, it's very different from the book. There's the blog um, mm -hmm. that I published back in 2014. And I did do in one of my posts, I kind of couldn't help myself after I'd watched all 30 films. I was doing mm -hmm. other posts about what are the extras on the Criterion box set? How many DVDs have there been of the Zatoichi films? Oh, wow. Um, and I did do a ranking of my personal oh, favorites nice. too. So you okay. can look at that on there. I, I, did I will think... include a link to that. Just send that to me and I'll, I'll put that. Yeah, in. sure, yeah. sure. I'll send, I'll send that on if that's of yeah. interest. You know, please excuse any typos. I did this <laughs> very uh, fast yeah. over like 30 days, you know. Sure, um, sure. Uh, some of it may not make sense. Um, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, there is a ranking on there. And I did I did genuinely think um, Zatoichi Challenge that I mentioned from earlier was definitely one of the best ones from yeah. Shintaro Katsu era. I would also say um, if, you're, if you're not looking to watch all um, 26 Katsu films and then the later remakes that came along, um, some of the later remakes are better than others. I'll, I'll come back to that. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, a good place to start is, is always to see the beginning because the first Satoichi film is very different. Um, oh, uh -huh. The character actually takes its inspiration from a short story. And if anyone does want to bite the bullet and get the massive 25 film Criterion box set, mm -hmm. a pleasant surprise that you'll find in that box set uh, uh, is the original short story um, that, um, that Zatoichi appears in, which was first published in 1948, I believe. Oh. So the character actually first appears in a short story. You can probably find this translated into English online, but it's a nice added extra um, mm -hmm. in that box set for sure. Um, and he's, he is a very different character. He's not the sword slinging um, hero on the side of the downtrodden that he became in the films. Mm -hmm. He's actually a Yakuza to start with, a gambler. Mm -hmm. And he's, first of all, guarding a Yakuza gambling den. If there's any oh. trouble in a gambling den you know he'll stop it right there and then 
Mm-hmm. Um, but then he decides to cut ties. Uh, this isn't too much of a spoiler to say, and there's more that happens in the story. Uh, he decides to cut ties with the gangster that he's associated because he doesn't agree morally with what he's doing. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, he's uh, he's a very different character in the short story, and then and then different again, I would say, in the first film, which establishes him as a wandering masseur, which is new from the short story. That's mm-hmm. not uh not um taken from the source material but it does help to contextualize the character in terms of 19th century japan um the the exact year is never established but because in later zatoichi films you know he's fighting off um people that have pistols and some other west oh. you, can, <laughs> uh-huh. you can guess this is towards the end of the tokugawa era the 19th century i, I, I was assuming <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah exactly um this even happens in the kitano film i think he does fight off a guy that has a pistol at one point oh okay it's amusing to see uh-huh. um uh yeah i forgot to mention earlier because you hadn't seen zatoichi yet it did get re-released on blu-ray funnily enough earlier this year by paramount oh. and that does get me wondering if it's going to turn up on the paramount plus service which i don't know sure. about yet because it's just about to launch here in the uk we haven't oh, got okay. it over here yet yeah, yeah um yeah. so it might be on there um so yeah sorry i went off another tangent again the <laughs> first okay. zatoichi film is the first Satoichi film is, is is very different. Again, he's established as a wandering masseur and he is still a gambler, although it's kind of a hobby for him. He doesn't see himself as a Yakuza loyal to a gang boss. He's he's a wandering masseur because of his blind blindness. And this is actually one of the few means of employment a blind man could get in medieval Japan, being a mm-hmm. masseur or a musician. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you become a well-trained masseur or musician, you could become part of the... Uh, very uh, high-ranking kind of order of blind people, as they were known at the time, kengyo. And mm. if you became, became became particularly wealthy as a kengyo, you could be uh, also become a money lender. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Zatoichi never reaches that status, though. He's kind of a more of a lowly, wandering masseur type, often blowing uh, a whistle or a flute. You see in some of the films, trying to say, um, you know, uh, that was his way of saying, oh, I'm here if you want a massage. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, that's how he'd get payments. And he'd often then make more money from gambling because that's often established in the Zatoichi films. He can hear how the dice rolls. So he never loses, which <laughs> can cause him trouble as well as getting him rich. Sure. Um, uh, so that's all established in the first film. And in the first film, he's actually very, very reluctant to draw his sword. It's clear that he has skills because he he um, he travels back to a, a boss that he used to be friends with and who's desperate to employ him because you know how, how good he is with the sword so that he can take over a rival gang's territory. Mm. But Zatoichi is very reluctant to do this because um, mm. it's he, he sees it as uh, the morally wrong thing to do. Um, eventually, circumstances work against him that he has to fight at the end. And also, he makes friends with a rival swordsman employed by the rival um, uh, rival gang. Mm. And this is one of these famous tropes of lots of samurai and Shambara films. You know, they become friends, first of all, and are forced to fight by the end of it. And right. also the reason that the r- rival swordsman wants to fight Zatoichi is that he has tuberculosis. You know, he's terminally ill mm. and he'd rather go out, you know, in a fight than just die of consumption. Yeah. Um, so it's a, it's a very different film because it seems, um, and, and this does fit with the director of, uh, 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 of the film, Kenji Misumi, who, though he's famous for making loads of violent samurai films, um, including more and more Zatoichi films as the Caesar series went on, he's always got the same tone in his films of like, you know, violence not always being the answer or condemning violent actions. Oh, and this is very strong in the first Zatoichi film. And the studio Dae just thought they'd do this because they'd adapted some of the uh, short story authors' other works and they've been really, really good for them in terms mm-hmm. of they've been popular at Dae as well as other, other studios. So they thought, oh, we'll try this one and we'll give this upcoming star that we have, um, Shintaro Katsu, a go at this lead role and mm-hmm. see what he does with it. It was a surprise hit, basically. So Dae quickly jumped on the bandwagon. In the same year, 1962, they released a sequel. And that second film um, kind of establishes the Zatoichi formula. All, all, all of a sudden, he's fighting more bad guys. He's not as reluctant <laughs> to draw his sword. Right. Um, and, and even um, he did this a couple of times in the Zatoichi films and the TV episodes, because there was a later TV series, too, for Zatoichi. 
Um, only ran for a few years, though. Um, in the second film, you get the first appearance of his brother. Again, Tommy Saburo Wakayama turns uh-huh. up as the bad guy. Uh-huh. And he would do that in a, in a few films. Um, but going back to your original question, sorry, which I know I've veered a long way from, um, that's why I recommend the first two films, because there's that change uh, in style of the films. They are both in black and white, and they're the mm-hmm. only two Zakuichi films in black and white. Um, mm-hmm. But they're, they're both really good in different ways. The first one is a very different kind of Zatoichi film. If you, if you know of the character from later films, you'll think this is very different. Mm-hmm. This is, uh, yeah, in, in terms of tone. But then by the second film, they're establishing this very quickly as an action franchise, which is what it were going to be. Then right. I would say Zatoichi Challenged is, is one of the best ones. There's, there's numerous others I could name, but I don't want to overwhelm people. Mm-hmm. Um, or yourself, if you're asking, as a, <laughs> uh, as an entryway into these films, and then you know my entryway as well was the Kitano film. It's a yeah, perfectly yeah, yeah. good place to start, and it it has to be said it's one of the better um, ones, the remakes out there. Notwithstanding the Hollywood English language remake, Blind Fury, which mm-hmm. I kind of still have a soft spot for, <laughs> I do think it's one of Rutger Hoyer's better action films uh-huh. in the eighties for sure. Um, uh, so the Kitano film is also really good. The later remakes in Japan, um, not so much. Uh, right. The Ichi, Ichi film was interesting in what it tried to do, you know, give this heroic, um, uh, legendary character, you know, over to a woman po- to portray. Mm-hmm. And Haruka Ayase does uh, the best job sh- she can with this role. It just mm-hmm. falls into kind of a uh, becoming a roman- romantic melodrama in the second half, which mm-hmm. doesn't work. Yeah. You, you want you want her to be the independent sword slashing her- heroine mm. and that's kind of taken away in the second half and it's a real shame because there was a lot of potential in that film yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and then i would say it, it's kind of sad that we're there the most recent japanese zatoichi film um because all the later ones that i've written about in the book are kind of homages to the character either in japan or elsewhere around the world but the l- most recent japanese zatoichi film was zatoichi the last in mm. 2010 um, which is, you know, um, the less said about the better. It's just <laughs> not good. Um, uh-huh. Yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying to think of some redeeming quality, and it, it does have it. Do- it does have, although he makes all sorts of films now. And I think he's still going. Tatsuya Nakadai does appear in it, who is uh-huh. um, often play, sometimes played the villain in earlier Zatoichi films, as well oh, as being most okay. most famous as the actor that would face off against Toshiro Mifune in more than one Kurosawa Shambara oh, film. Okay, okay. Um, so yeah, Tatsuya Nakadai is, is a great actor in it. And mm. also in the film is Suzubu Terajima, who starred in many Kitano films. Oh, okay. So there are some interesting names attached. It's just they completely yeah. um, kind of do Zatoichi the wrong way. Everything oh. happens that you'd expect in a Zatoichi film, but they also mm. try to change a lot of stuff. Mm. And it just doesn't work. I'm trying to. I'm trying to say as much as I can without going into spoilers. <laughs> yeah. Although I'm. I'm trying not to sell this film, so I could spoil it completely if you want. <laughs> yeah. But if anyone is is curious and and wants uh-huh. to be a completist out there, maybe I'll leave that for you to find. But I wouldn't recommend that right, people right. start off with Zatoichi the Last. Yeah. Although although I wouldn't even recommend that you leave that as the last Zatoichi film that you watch. <laughs> leave a it might leave a bad taste in your mouth <laughs> yeah yeah honest. yeah yeah. that's where um, the uh like just complete completionist that just has to has to watch everything even if they already yeah. know it's not particularly that, worth that, it. that was me i got through the films yeah. first and then although i uh that was what i did for my 30 days of zatoichi challenged i got up to zatoichi the last and i was lucky that i'd left myself blind fury as the last one so that was oh. a really good <laughs> That was a really good palate cleanser after yeah. Zatoichi the last, if I'm honest. And then, <laughs> and then after that, I had to make. Once I decided to go on this journey of writing up a book on the history of the Zatoichi films uh-huh. and the global influence, I also had to find a few years after that the time to watch all of the TV episodes. Oh my goodness! Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I watched all 100 of them Jeez. that were made. Which, which sounds like a lot, but that is not, uh, I found out through my research, that is not the longest running Japanese uh, TV series by any stretch of the imagination. Um, <laughs> but it was still, it's still a lot for me to go through and try and fit in, uh, especially around at that time. I was pretty much teaching at university full time. Yeah. So that was a, that was a job. Um, <laughs> yeah. 
and I, I hasten to add as well, in case anyone's wondering, God, what, what did you write the book about? Are there just like 100 pages of each Zatoichi TV episode? No, no, there is not. <laughs> I did a kind of more healthy summary because uh -huh. after watching all these TV episodes, I was like, yeah, a lot of these are really the same. Uh, <laughs> the, more, the more interesting ones to write about were the ones that were a bit different, tried to add something a bit stylish and different. Yeah. Especially when it got to the end where I really wasn't expecting this. Um, they they cancelled the TV series and mm -hmm. I think Katsu knew it was coming. He wanted to bring the character back in some shape or form, but he knew that the end of the TV series was coming and he got one of his friends in the film industry to direct the two-part episodes, uh -huh. um, uh, which... I wasn't expecting him to direct uh, the end of the film. This was the director of, sorry, I've just got to remind myself of the, um, uh, the director's name because I keep forgetting it. He directed The Woman in the Dunes from 1964. Oh, oh well, I, I know that book, but... Yeah, Hiroshi Tashigihara mm -hmm. directed the film um, in 1964. And in, then in 1979, he directs the two-part finale to the Zatoichi TV series, which mm -hmm. is really strange. Um, you wouldn't expect that, especially because of the type of films that he's known for. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I do have to say in the second half, which uh, is called The Dream Journey. So the clues in the title, mm -hmm. it is this wild dream that the Zatoichi character has. Yeah. And boy, does it play out like that. It oh, plays out like, almost like a weird uh, Hiroshi Teshigahara <laughs> film. <laughs> That just so happens to have the Zatoichi character in there. <laughs> this just reminds me of Top Not Detective. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it kind of does. Maybe, 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 yeah, uh, exactly. <laughs> this uh, this is more credit to the directors of Top Not Detective. Maybe yeah. they had seen that finale and were partially inspired by it. Yeah, it's like the later the show goes, the crazier it gets, right? Like... Oh, yeah. Boy, <laughs> did it. Yeah, especially, yeah, it was largely all the same, like lots of different adventures after which he gets into. Some oh. of them were especially boring because they were rehashing plots from the films. I'm like, wow, you're really running out of ideas. <laughs> um, but then by the end, they just went all out and almost made a, you know, Japanese new wave style finale for the TV <laughs> series. It's really I bizarre. It. Yeah. I love that. I think I may just have to track down those last two episodes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they're worth they're worth skipping to. Uh, the first half is like almost your stereotypical Zatoichi adventure, and uh -huh. then it ends. The second half is called the Dream Journey, uh -huh. and it just goes nuts, absolutely <laughs> nuts. Oh man, okay, I love that sort of stuff. All right, uh, yeah, okay. So I, I I did have one more question that's unrelated to sure. Zatoichi, but you said uh, you wanted to let people know about uh, the the price of the book with the for the there's like a discount for the yes, 60th anniversary. Yes, I'll I'll just mention that quickly. Um, yeah, the um, if you go to roman.com, that mm -hmm. is the publisher. So it's Roman and Litterfield. Uh, technically, the Paths of Zatoichi is published through one of their um, their uh, partner companies, Lexington Books. Mm -hmm. um, but there is a 30% discount code, which oh, works awesome. for uh, both the physical copy of the book and also the digital copy. Uh, I'll send you that code as well via email. I'll just mention it here just in case it's sure. uh, the code LXFANDF3O. Okay. And that is valid for the remainder of 2022. So we're in June now. Yep. So if you want to think about buying a copy of the book, you've got five months to think about it basically awesome. um yeah and um yeah that all that discount code will give you 30 percent off okay that, hey awesome 30 percent until the end of the year so an uh, end of 2022 yeah, um to celebrate I'll the, the link to celebrate too. the 60th anniversary of the film franchise great okay um so all right then last question i i heard you mention that you were doing some sort of research on like subtitles and dubs some something in that area could you tell us a little bit about that that sounded i i love anything related with translation and all that <laughs> sort of stuff so uh yeah. yeah i'll i'll tell you what i can but this yeah. idea is still very early days mm -hmm. i mean um a lot of my colleagues at my current you know uh, at the university where i work university of greenwich and other universities have said that it's been a mad year mm -hmm. for all sorts of reasons sure um so yeah this is still very early stages while i finish up some other research in fact uh, it's funny that i'm talking to you now i'm still not done writing about zatoichi i, I got asked to do another <laughs> book chapter <laughs> Jeez, um, uh -huh. for an edited collection T taking uh -huh. a slightly different perspective on zatoichi i ended up um, I sent off a revised draft just earlier today as it happens, and I've kind of 
I, I kind of appreciated the chance to, I still think there's flaws with the film, but it offered me the chance to re-examine the 2008 Itchy film, which, mm-hmm. as I said, has a lot of potential. It's just a shame that the second half um, mm. kind of loses that. Mm. Um, so that and some other research commitments I have to get out of the way, but I'm, I'm, uh, I, uh, this is another idea that I think is more quickly growing in my head than the Zatoichi idea, I'm glad to say, mm-hmm. of looking into subtitling and dubbing practices because I just see more and more variety being offered on this in terms of streaming services at the moment because mm-hmm. content is getting so much more popular around the world. Yeah. And I realized I might have an interesting entryway into this through research that I've done uh, on Zatoichi. Mm-hmm. Um, I got really lucky in 2019, uh, before the pandemic hit, I managed to get across to Paris. And this was, again, thanks to a recommendation by Tom Mez. Mm-hmm. I was getting in touch with him, trying to get his recommendation about um, you know, if I'm looking to write about Zatoichi, do I need to get to Japan? Because uh, I'll, I'll be honest, I'm, I'm still sad to say this. I've not had the opportunity to go yet. Time mm-hmm. and money and opportunities have just been against me mm-hmm. despite writing this book. But my book was about how the impact of Zatoichi has had such an impact around the world. You know, I could research it lots of different ways. Mm-hmm. But he said, um, when I got in touch with him in 2019, uh, Tom Mez said, Um, yeah Japan's great if you can get to it but much closer to you there's some great scholars in Paris Mm. um, looking into Japanese culture the Maison de la Culture du Japon I Mm. hope I've remembered that right Mm. Um, and um, yeah I managed to get there the University of Greenwich uh, Mm. were more happy to uh, pay for me to travel to Paris than Japan for obvious reasons (laughs) distance and cost Um, and uh, I met this uh, great schol- scholar who's uh, written a few books on Japanese cinema himself and recorded a few documentaries of Japanese filmmakers called Robin Gatto, who mm-hmm. also works as a translator. Um, so it was great meeting him because not only does he know quite a bit of Japanese and also French, he also knows English. So mm-hmm. he, was, he was a really good entry point. And he mm-hmm. allowed me to speak to another scholar who'd written a uh, master's thesis on some Zatoichi films as well, Fabrice Arduini. Mm-hmm. And um, so they were able to tell me a lot about um, some of the screenings they had done about Zatoichi films. They'd helped to release some of the DVDs, uh, films on DVD in France. Mm. Um, and um, since then, um, Robin's been working as a translator. And every now and again, he gets in touch with me to mm. ask if he's getting his English grammar right for a translation, which mm. is... Uh, which, you know, he just does this with anyone that can get hold of and is fluent in English, just wants to check it's all right. Sure. And this uh, this uh, has also given me an idea uh, as a potential entryway into interviewing people that do um, subtitling and dubbing and what's yeah. the kind of uh, like labor practices involved, especially in light of the fact that more and more of these companies are coming to light, more and more of these people that do this, because mm-hmm. right at the end of, of either a film or a tv series on netflix whether i've been watching a dub or a subtitle uh track uh for a particular film or tv show um you know those companies will be credited either the dubbing studio or the translators uh for the subtitlers and i'm just kind of interested to find more about those people Mm -hmm. i i know there's some research being done to that i've heard lots of horror stories about how how little these people are paid and Mm -hmm. what tight deadlines they have to work against Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm also interested to try and interview n- these people and find out more about that. Um, mm-hmm. There's some interesting translation studies, I'm happy to say, at the University of Greenwich. I've come across a PA- uh, two PhD students, actually, mm-hmm. really interested in this field. I hope to learn a lot from them. And I know that uh, I only found out recently that people that I know uh, based in Japan, like Adam Terrell, who runs Third Window Films, mm-hmm. and another... Um, uh kind of digital marketing and dvd authoring specialist that also lives over in japan andrew kirkham they do a lot of their own translation work again to help get japanese films to the uk market and also Mm -hmm. the usa market and other countries around the world um so they're they're kind of my entry points into learning about you know subtitling and uh and dubbing practices and uh you know power structures in terms of labor and corporations who's having more influence you know is 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 netflix now um paying for more and more of these companies and translators to do stuff or is it still kind of you know uh a dang uh, uh, uh a kind of 
you know, more unregulated territory to get into where mm. people might not know what they're getting into and how kind of similar to like, um, I'm glad you pointed out me to your podcast series, Tony. Mm-hmm. Thank you for that. Oh, because I oh, did listen you. to your, um, I did listen to your podcast with Jen O'Connell. Oh yeah. Yeah. Name, yeah. Right? Je- uh, Jen O'Donnell, I think. Yeah. Jen O'Donnell. Sorry. Yeah. I got a name wrong. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was really interesting listening to her experiences of how she got into translation. So yeah. I'd, I'd love to speak to more people like her to find yeah. out about their experiences. And I need to, I need to kind of structure this project and map out my aims and what I want to go for moving forward and make a list of people that I want to contact. Cause I've realized that through my Zatoichi research, through the people that I've just mentioned and some others that I've come across, I've mm-hmm. got potentially a lot of people to talk through and I need to just, I need to just order these ideas before I go out and, and sure. study this more. Yeah. Um, so that's I where mean, I am with that, with that at the moment, basically that's spiel I've just mm-hmm. given you, which is yeah, well, <laughs> that, that is super fascinating to me. And I'd love to talk to you, you know, whenever that, you know, comes, comes out and, and I'm sure we could have a uh, hours of conversation just on that topic alone, but like, it's always, I don't know exactly how it is in the film industry, but you know, with manga, anime, and I think games to some extent, there's a whole lot of like secrecy, like a lot of NDAs. And sometimes really? to the point where it's like, well, why can't this person say that she worked on this project after it's come out? Right? Like, it, yeah. it, it's kind of perplexing in a way, like, why that level of secrecy? So. Yeah, that is that is interesting. Yeah, and uh, that only lifts you say afterwards because mm-hmm. um, something uh, I'm really annoyed I didn't notice it first. Uh, my my partner Christina, um, she pointed out to me. Um, I'm I'm really annoyed I didn't see this first. She pointed out to me some videos of uh, that Netflix I think have put up of some of their um, subtitling being done. I think it was more specifically dubbing actually, showing mm-hmm. a video making of of the efforts that they go through for dubbing and re- recording new soundtracks in the studios. Mm. I found that interesting that they're putting up on their social media feeds, but it's very mm. much, as you've said, it's, it's after the fact, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. after these shows have been released. And that reminds me of the other way um, that I've become aware of this was actually a good few years ago. And I'm kind of going back to this idea and exploring it further. I did write uh, back in 2015 uh, an article, which I could also send to you if you mm-hmm. if you're interested. Um, I'll, I'll send to anyone who's interested if they want to get in touch, unless you can get access to through your library the East Asian Journal of Popular Culture. Uh-huh. I I wrote an article for them on the Death Note anime series oh, and uh-huh. how it came out on DVD in the UK because mm-hmm. um, the UK extras and I don't know if this is the same for the American release mm-hmm. but I think so because it was largely financed by an American company as well as the UK company known at the time Manga Entertainment now they're known oh. as Funimation yeah. which which I know has been going for many years yeah. in the states I think Funimation yeah yeah and I think Funimation just got bought out by Crunchyroll. Oh, re- oh yes i did read that story yes yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah. the the for the past 20 years it's like these these media companies have just been bought out bought out bought out bought yeah. out and it's like just less and less and less of them yeah and it's interesting that that's happened by Crunchyroll because mm-hmm. um yeah didn't they start off as a piracy site <laughs> I, I don't remember that but it wouldn't surprise me <laughs> yeah I, I i've read a few stories in the uh, magazine that's published in the uk neo magazine uh-huh. uh i think they'll be celebrating if i've got the dates right maybe in the next couple of years i think they'll be celebrating 20 years of being published uh-huh, they've, uh-huh. they've published that story a lot how Crunchyroll kind of started out first of all as a piracy site oh, and then quickly wow. tied to and quickly turned to monetization of it to make themselves legitimate wow so, huh. yeah okay yeah, and now and now they're buying out companies like Funimation. You know what a world we live in. Yeah, crazy, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, going back to my Death Note article, yeah, I yeah, focused yeah. on the DVD release because mm-hmm. most of the extras of the copies that you can get in the UK as well as in the USA, I think um, they focus on the dub track and how that was made for mm-hmm. the anime series. There's one DVD extra on one of the discs that I have. That is an interview with the um, the animation team behind the series, mm-hmm. and I think I think that also includes an interview with the original manga authors mm-hmm. as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's it. Most of the extras are about um, the work that went into the dub, mm-hmm. which is really interesting. You think, especially these days, I think if Death Note was re released on DVD, and I wouldn't be surprised if that happens. It's such a popular series. Mm-hmm. Um, more explanation or or more focus would be given to how it was created in japan 
But it was curious to me at the time when I wrote this article in 2015, I'm like, they're really emphasizing the dub. So, you, you know, these, these DVD extras, depending on if you're a fan of subtitling or dubbing, they can kind of um, really raise a viewer's appreciation of what work goes into the dub track. Yeah. Like that, that's really interesting to me in that, like the, the, the face, uh, well, the voice actor that does the, in this case, the English language dub becomes this kind of proxy or like, like this, this way for people to connect with somebody associated with the project that does not have a language barrier, right? Because, yeah. you know, the average anime consumer cannot speak Japanese to the point where they would be able to communicate with the author or the, the original voice cast. But, you know, like Steve Bloom, for example, you know, Spike Spiegel from Cowboy Bebop, like, yeah. you know, people can talk to him, people can, you know, tweet at him or whatever. And, and like, they can have this connection with this person that is associated with Cowboy Bebop, but yeah. they can't do that with the Japanese side of things, right? No, yeah. no, that's very, uh, that's very true. You're right. Although those, uh, I've, I have, I know a little bit of knowledge about the flip side of this. Again, thanks to Neo Magazine, they have mm -hmm. their own Japanese dub celebrities, but in a different way, uh, mm -hmm. like famous Japanese voice actors, because that's how I've heard a lot of Western films get released into Japanese cinemas. They're mostly mm -hmm. dubbed. So mm -hmm. you have a Japanese voice actor that's associated with Tom Cruise. Or oh, George yeah, yeah. Seen the, yeah, and yeah they, are, they are the voice of the Western actor. You know, yeah. if a Japanese person suddenly hears like Brad Pitt, George Clooney or Tom Cruise's real voice, they might yeah. be confused, yep. mightn't they? Because they'll have a certain sound in the cinema to them. Yeah. So that's probably the closest equivalent, but again, is a bit different. Well, uh -huh. the, the more and more I think about it, I think not really, because again, like Steve Bloom and other famous voice actors, you know, they do they do more than one series, don't they? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah Or films. True. And yeah. uh, it does remind me, I have seen these guys, you know, advertising that you can come and get an autograph from them at Comic-Con in the UK uh -huh. and other parts of the world too. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it's interesting. But yeah, like, I, I'm aware of that phenomenon where it's like the, I, I don't know, like just the Schwarzenegger guy is like always this yeah. one, you know, voice yeah. actor in Japan. Like he's the guy that does his voice. It's it's such yeah. a weird thing when you think about it from our perspective, yeah. but it, it makes sense, right? You want you want this voice associated with the image of this guy, like this famous yeah. person. So uh, it's, yeah. it's interesting that you mentioned Schwarzenegger as an example, because yeah. he did try to make the effort to go to Japan and speak Japanese. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, you've reminded me of, oh God, I'd almost forgotten I wrote this essay when I was doing my master's uh -huh. on um, Western celebrities turning up in Japanese adverts. <laughs> oh yeah, he, he's got some, some good ones. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the crazy, I forget what it's called, the crazy energy drink. Yeah, 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 I remember that he's one, called, yeah. He's, he's called Shvachan. Yeah. And uh, he's berated as an office worker or he just, yeah. he's commuting and then suddenly goes crazy. And then, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah almost literally explodes in one of them after he's had this energy drink. I'm not, it's yeah. not a great advert, really. I don't want to explode when after drinking something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's back in the day when these, you know, celebrities could do that in Japan and it didn't immediately come back to, yeah. to the US, right? But nowadays, yeah. you know, with the internet, like, that's impossible, so. Yeah, yeah, exactly. In the early days of the internet, it happened. I mean, now everyone yeah. can find this stuff on YouTube, but yeah. I remember one of the sources for my essay at the time was this website that did it before YouTube called yeah. Japanda. Oh, um, uh, -huh. uh, I think it was called japanda.com. Uh, -huh. uh, you might be able to still find it online and, um, it's a bit out of date though, cause it plays most of its clips in quick time. Oh, said, <laughs> yeah, that, before, man, that takes me yeah, back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is the days before YouTube and, yeah. um, they did post up on their FAQ page that they had received some cease and desist orders from Leonardo <laughs> DiCaprio and Meg oh. Ryan. <laughs> but of course you can tell now that we live in the world that we live in yeah. um you know you can easily find this stuff on youtube so it yeah. was uh, that was going to fade away pretty quickly that sort of legal action <laughs> <laughs> oh man okay i i i am fully confident we could keep going for another hour but <laughs> <laughs> I, will, I will stop here but um yeah guys if you're curious about the book there's a discount so you could go check that out link in the show notes also for uh the articles if you want to check out the zatoichi ranking but uh well uh, jonathan thank you so much that was an absolute pleasure and i look forward to hopefully catching up again sometime in the future maybe we can talk more about translation and all that kind of stuff um sure whenever i get that project off the ground i'll, yeah. I'll try and remember to keep you updated yeah, yeah, and yeah. um let, let you know where i get with it just do it!